Hello dear students, a very good morning to you and today we have come here to talk about a rather very interesting topic uh, which is Nirodh C. Choudhury's autobiography uh, and uh, the autobiography of an unknown Indian. So before we go into Choudhury, let me briefly discuss what is an autobiography where does Nirodh C. Choudhury stand in the history of autobiography writing? What kind of an autobiography it is? And if possible, let me trace for you a very brief history of autobiography as a genre before I go into Nirodh C. Choudhury's direct writings. So you see, autobiography writing is a very difficult kind of a genre, autobiography is. Uh, it is that part of the literature which is personal. It reveals a person from his own perspective and its main interest lies in the consciousness or the subconscious ruminations of a person in his or her self-portrayal. So it is the author's self-portrayal. Now, Shipley, in his brilliant book on literary terms writes the autobiography proper is a connected narrative of the author's life with stress laid on introspection or on the significance of his life against a wider background. Therefore you can understand that locating one's life against a wider background is a very difficult task. The writer must not only give an account of his outer life <coughs> by relying mostly on chronology, but he must or she must also give an account of the inner life. That is what inspired him, what were the ideas and emotions that kept on going around in his head. Uh, the sensations which were very dear to him or to her. Now, only through his conscious... Now, I'll be referring to the author as he because we are primarily dealing with autobiography with respect to Nirotsi Choudhury. So, I will not be keep on referring to... Um, I'll not keep on referring to the entire fact as he or she, he or she. So, since it's Nirotsi Choudhury, I am going to stick to him. Now, you can understand that when the writer has to talk about or when the author has to talk about both his inner and out of life. So, only through his conscious self-delineation can the author arrive at this. However, the subconscious influences are there as well. And both the internal and the external life should find the literary expression and this demands a command of language and also an artistic self-control. Because when I am talking about myself, I might go on rambling for hours without making any sense. And there must be a constant sifting and shifting, also an ordering of the material at hand. That is, everything which has happened in my life does not deserve a place in my book. If you read, for instance, Rousseau's Confessions, then you see that there Rousseau is talking about how he visited prostitution centers, how he lied, how he cheated, and so on and so forth. So therefore, you can understand that autobiography or the, rather the material of autobiography has to go under a very conscious editing and this editing has to be very, very continuous. Now, everything which does not have a direct implication or an indirect influence on the author's being must be cut off. It must be edited severely. And digressions and anecdotes 
are very very welcome in this genre because digressions and anecdotes often offer a deliberate richness and variety however too much of anything spoils the broth so they must be conscious of how much they are putting in it now in any form of art no matter whatever you are writing even if you are writing your answer then also selection election and deletion are the process that we all go through imagine i am reading a book and i love this paragraph but then i see that i have already mentioned this paragraph i mean the substance of this paragraph in my answer so either i'll have to keep the paragraph of the book or i'll have to keep the paragraph that i have written so this is the dilemma that we when we are writing answers face so you must understand that what the author has to go through because here one examiner is not reading his script but rather perhaps millions and billions of people just as in the case of rousseau just as in the case of rabindranath just as in the case of gandhi just as in the case of nirodhsi choudhury are reading so what happens is while writing an autobiography there are certain issues which come into question first of all we have a tendency of glorifying ourselves that is in our own head we have our own glorified picture there is okay i'll study this from this to this period maybe for these many months and i'll score a brilliant marks but i am not focusing on how much i am studying say so i decide that okay from every day 7 in the morning to maybe 2 in the afternoon i'll be studying and every 5 minutes i am watching the clock okay it's 7:05 okay these many hours left it's 8 okay these many hours left now after 10 you decide that okay enough is enough i have studied a lot today and i need to get some refreshment and then the refreshment lasts for 2 3 hours so this is also one way of going about it so we all have an elevated mental picture of ourselves and it is often seen that in an autobiography such exaggerations happen also you know some people say that my life is an open book it's a open book and what happens is that yes our lives are often an open book but there are some pages and some chapters which we deliberately skip that is the truth with all of us there are certain pages and certain chapters that we do not wish to speak about in public here in lies the problem of the autobiography writer that is should he or she edit those and delete those and pretend that they never happened or should they be very uh conscious of writing about those influences writing about those traumatic experiences those experiences which they are ashamed of and bring them to the forefront to the public in general Now, this is a question that all autobiography writers must face now what happens is that on the one hand there is the temptation of self glorification on the other hand there is the extreme desire of self concealment and therefore the autobiography author is always already under a sort of erasure he or she is writing always under pressure he or she is always facing a double edged sword which they must uh, deal with so this is uh, one major problem with all autobiography writers all right sorry that was my phone uh, so this is a problem with all autobiography writers also there has to be some consciousness since shipley writes that their life against the general larger background 
so there will be influences and the influences will be social cultural literary political economical religious and so on and so forth now all of these influences have gone into the making of the author's personality of his own identity and of the person that he or she is today however here also the author must keep in mind that like all of us the author is also a creature of circumstances of environments and they must be fully taken into account however you know if the if one guy who always keeps on talking arguing debating in the nearest tea stall from your house he decides to write uh, his own autobiography the autobiography of a tea stall debater i don't know it might sound as a very uh, interesting topic nowadays since we are already enmeshed in cultural studies and high culture and low culture are freely mixing right now however in the traditional sense of the autobiography most people would not be interested in reading about his life so if i am going to read an autobiography whether it is i am malala whether it is mary com's autobiography whether it is the letters of sister nivedita whether it is uh, the autobiography of an unknown indian whether it is uh, gandhi's autobiography or tagore's autobiography whenever we are going into an autobiography we are going with certain expectations that i can learn something from this guy for instance i am a huge fan of dr kalam and all of his writings and every week now i don't get the pleasure of reading dr kalam every day but every week every sunday i take at least one hour out of my schedule to read dr kalam's writings they are mostly autobiographical and they inspire me a lot frankly they inspire me a lot so what happens is that look since the author's life is projected against the general panorama of life so the influences the social impetus the social stimuli that have made him what he is whether he is a good man or whether he is a bad man you have watched wolf of wall street now that is based on a real life incident now i don't know if there is such an autobiography however what happens is wolf of wall street is actually based on the real life story of the person jordan belmont or something belfont or something what is name i forgotten the same thing goes for catch me if you can now what happens is that if the circumstances have made him to go to the wrong direction or there have been temptations that he could not resist the writer often must address it because you know these are also certain autobiographies which inspire us which inspire us because we are not simply interested in his joys and sorrows we are seeking the story of a man we are seeking the history of a man and as the pop prob- popular saying goes his story is history my story is mystery now how do you unravel your own mysteries by reading others histories that's the funda right so therefore what happens is that autobiography is an art which combines the elements of both literature and of history it's fact and fiction woven together now it therefore does not only present before us an expression of the autobiographer self but it is in a sense a bildungsroman narrative of how the narrator became what he is but here the bildungsroman is based on fact and the fictionality is primarily on the part on how the author arranges 
his own life. So, what happens is that an autobiography does a dual thing. Number one is that it helps us probe into the author's psyche and it gives us a creative growth, a creative development of the author. Also, an autobiography influences our own psychology in such a way that we find influence from that. So basically, a genuine autobiography is both a venture into truth and also an experiment in being and thus a great autobiography combines the most significant features of philosophy, of psychology and of history as well. I hope I am making sense because I am just saying it from my mind. What I understand to be autobiography. I just have two or three quotes jotted down. And I am talking about autobiography from my own perspective. So this is my own take on autobiography. Now, it is a very popular form right now. Because uh, in the previous years, many, many writers from different fields certain Bollywood stars, Hollywood stars, certain con men, certain gurus, uh, the spiritual quote-unquote gurus, um, certain politicians, certain lawyers, they have all written their autobiography. And uh, if you read uh, Fali's Nariman's Before Memory Fades, it's a brilliant autobiography. Even uh, Nani Palkiwala's uh, We the People, We the Nation, and also there are several great autobiographies by lawyers who are talking about cases that change their lives, who are talking about events that change their lives. And there are certain beautiful autobiographies by certain uh, film stars. There are certain beautiful auto autobiographies by certain athletes, certain humanitarian workers, and so on and so forth. And I would urge you that read autobiographies because I love reading autobiographies. It gives you so much insight into what is happening around the world. How did this how did these people feel that face the changes? How did they come across? Just reading, uh, you can win. Tough times never last, but tough people do won't do. Read autobiographies because you know it's easy saying that okay, this and this and this is happening. You can't change this and that and that. Uh, or be Iki guy, or be something guy, or that other guy. I personally feel that that does not help me. Rather, autobiographies inspire me because people have been through these and people have lived through these. And now that we are facing a pandemic, I think we need all the inspiration that we can get. And that's the beauty of autobiography. It can inspire you by showing that, yes, people have been through what you are going through, People have come across, so can you. As the famous refrain of Dior Slam and goes in Anglo-Saxon period, that was overcome, so may this. So now, uh, I'll come back. That uh, Autobiography is now a genre of worldwide craze. And uh, the craze has also inspired several Indians who have taken the genre with gusto, we have taken the genre uh, basically with a lot of vigor and they have kind of caused an upheaval in the genre of autobiography. And therefore, the genre of autobiography is not altogether new in the Indian soil and rather it is a very interesting way of looking at Indian history as well. Because if you read the Indian autobiographies, you can see a steady development of Indian legislature, of Indian economics, of Indian cinema, of Indian systems of education, of Indian economy, and so on and so forth. Of even maybe if a great professors were to write autobiographies, since they haven't done, but uh, their autobiographies have been written, their biographies have been written by others. Uh, for instance, uh, in Bengali, if you have read Bengali, then there is a brilliant series of biographies and influences called Master Mushtai. Then there is a, perhaps by Bilin Chattopadhyay, 
it's alokere jhanna dharai which contains the lives of uh, five great professors of the early 60s or the early 50s of the last century so you see autobiography is a very autobiography and biography kind of teaches you a lot about your times and the times which have passed and therefore as i said it's a mix of philosophy psychology history maybe economics legislature religion and so on and so forth however you see all autobiographies have one thing in common that is they have motives but it is very difficult to distinguish an autobiography from another simply based on this motive system why because often we see that the motives are overlapping they are mixed however so many critics have suggested that let's categorize them based on the subjective and the objective however this is also a very broad classification and there cannot be any conclusive discussion on this that is how can you be absolutely objective about yourself also if you become absolutely subjective about yourself then you defeat the purpose of writing an autobiography it's like you are talking to yourself so nobody wants to hear your interior monologue you are not shakespeare for god's sake what happens is that every autobiography must always go under the uh conscious or subconscious mix of the subjective and the objective and therefore an autobiography cannot be absolutely subjective nor can it be absolutely objective therefore what can be achieved is classifying the autobiographies based on the mission that the individual author has embarked on so basically whatever the author did in his or her life let that categorize his autobiography because what happens is that the nature of experience of the life lived in a same profession in a same um desire in the same goal that kind of gives us an understanding of the profession of the goal of the life lived so therefore uh, what happens is that if you see then uh, if you focus on it then you will see that there are three broad categories but i am saying i am oversimplifying this okay so there are three broad categories under which autobiographies are generally divided one is religion the other is politics and third is either literary or life lived okay the so first is religion second is politics so first is religious autobiography of the saints of the gurus etc etc of those who claim to have visited god or had heavenly citations or maybe some religious leader and so on and so forth the second kind is political that is of the political leader of the political uh, person what he has done how he has uh, brought people together and so on and so forth and the third is based on activity now this can be literary this can be dramatic this can be cinematic this can be legislative this can be economic etc 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 now this was a very brief understanding of autobiography as much as i understand okay i do not know more however since autobiography is such a distinct literary expression and such a distinct literary form we must understand that what are the critical tropes that we must employ to bring out our consciousness of what the author is trying to say 
Now, why am I talking about critical tropes? Because at the end of the day, you are going to have to write an answer. Isn't it so? Otherwise, why are we dealing with this? I mean, Nirotsi Chaudhuri is a very difficult author. And as UG students, I personally do not expect that 90% would of you would be interested in him otherwise if he was not there in your syllabus. So, even in my graduation days, I had not even heard of Nirotsi Chaudhuri. It was in my master's that I fell in love with him. Uh, so, what happens is there is a basic lack of critical tropes which can interpret how we read autobiography or how we can understand autobiography or how we can talk about autobiography as a genre. Moreover, there is a dearth of a body of critique on autobiography. That is, if we had certain critical uh, works on autobiography by, say, great writers and so on and so forth, great critics, we still could have made some sense out of it. But there is seriously a dirt on it. Like, we have focused on fiction, we have focused on non-fiction, but we haven't given that much focus to autobiography as a genre. So it has always remained in the pleasure reading section and not much more. I'm not saying that there is no criticism. There is. There is a body of criticism. But compared to the criticism, the body of criticism in fiction, in non-fiction, autobiography is still a very, very untouched field. Thirdly, the task of differentiating and selecting from an already huge body or mass of material and finding what is relevant for you is very difficult. That is, what is the difference between an autobiography, a memoir and a travelogue? Because often I have come across certain memoirs which are not very autobiography-like. That is, they do not uh, give you proper insights into the person. They do not probe into the person, but rather talk about one or two achievements or three or four achievements. And from that, whatever you can make out, you can make out on your own. So there is nothing that the author would be giving you. There are no exaggerations, there are no concealments, there is no uh, basic, uh, what should I say, there is no basic challenge offered to the author, offered to the reader. And often what happens is that in the name of autobiography, what we see is that, okay, I was born in this year, I went to here, here, this is what I studied, blah, 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 blah. So it's so very factual that the auto or the self part is lost. I mean, anybody could have written that if he or she maintained a diary. Yeah, maybe something very interesting happened in your life. So that does not qualify as an autobiography. The autobiography, what I feel is that is a very difficult genre to comprehend and to write about. Now, there is one critique whose name is C RCP Sina. R.C.P. Sina says that the literary renaissance that began with Indians, India's contact with England made a remarkable contribution in so far as it excited and stimulated the autobiographical impulse in Indians. Not that they were discovering this impulse for the first time. An autobiographical tradition of a sort did exist but it was too weak and irregular to become significant feature of the national culture. There were indeed some elements in the Hindu tradition that hindered its free and natural growth. The forces of the new literary renaissance, however, freed the... Um, freed the autobiographical impulse 
from the trammels of such inhibitory factors. The period of the rise and growth of Indo-Anglican autobiography corresponds with one of the most dynamic periods in the history of India, characterized by a subtle commingling of and, and later a sharp conflict between the values of two great cultures, one ancient and the other modern. It saw the emergence on the Indian scene of science with its spirit of inquiry and politics with a growing concern of freedom for freedom. The growth of the practice of autobiography writing may be viewed as one of the typical manifestations of the spirit of the new age. It is not without significance that Raja Ram Mohan Roy, often called with often recalled with reverence the, as the father of modern India, wrote an account of his life in English. When the struggle for freedom became intensified and the whole nation was charged with new energy and inspiration, the time was ripe for a rich harvest of the autobiographical writings. During this period of national resurgence, the foundations of a truly great tradition of Indo-Anglian autobiography were laid. So basically what RCP Sinha points out is that he talks about the renaissance that took place in the history of Indian politics. That is when the British came to India and they wanted to create a Babu culture of educated Bengali um, clerks who would do their dirty work or their desk work for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what is so very significant over here is that biographies were written of kings and sovereigns, like Baba Nama and so on and so forth. So, writing of biography, writing of the annals and antiquities of the kings was not something new. But yes, autobiography was something new to Indians, and it is a product of India's colonial past. Because you see, India has a very peculiar disinterest with history. And it is this peculiar disinterest with history that has led to many gaps in our understanding of history itself. That is, there are no documentations, there are no proper documentations of large periods of time. Like we have Kotilya's uh, Arthashastra, we have uh, the documents left by Megasthenes, Yuen Sang, and others. But if you try to enumerate them, you won't get names of more than 100 writings. That is, I cannot remember the name names of even 10. And therein lies the problem. That is, we have had a series of a lack of documentation. And it is this lack of documentation which has led to several gaps in our understanding of our history. But autobiography comes in a very different tradition. It is a man's account of himself or a woman's account of herself. Now, there have been multiple autobiographies in the recent past, which are Dalit autobiographies and such autobiographies of the people who were left behind, who were deliberately suppressed, who were deliberately silenced. So the autobiography of the silenced is also very important. And in my next lecture, I'll be talking about these issues. So this was just an introductory lecture on what is autobiography. In the next lecture, I'll be addressing what is an Indian autobiography or an Indo-Anglican autobiography or an Indian autobiography in English. So I'll be addressing this issue. And I'll be tracing a development of the Indo-Anglican autobiography. Okay, so I'm studying for that. And uh, I hope by the next class that you have,
I'll be ready with some history from all the Indian writing books. Now, as you know, that Indian writing is not my forte. Uh, I have never been very good with Indian writing in English, uh, but I'm trying. I'm trying my level best. And if there are any questions, please put them in the comment section. I'll be very, very happy to answer you. Okay. This is something very, very new for me as well. So I am also learning. So there might be certain gaps in my knowledge as well. I'm following several books and I'm gaining as much knowledge as I can. So please bear with me and let's see how we can both learn from each other. All right. Have a good day. Thank you so much.